So this man, Al Gore, was doing something similar to what we're doing today in 2004. He was presenting what at that stage he still just called his slideshow uh, on, on climate change uh, to an audience in New York. He estimated that between 2000 and 2004, he had presented that slideshow about a thousand times, which if you think about it is kind of just more than once every two days. In 2004, in New York, in the audience was a film producer who was so inspired by his talk that she approached him and asked if they could make it into a documentary. Um, the documentary premiered in 2006 and went on to win the Academy Award for Best Documentary in that year. And more than that, exposed his message to a global audience of millions. Now, the key part of his message was, is kind of summed up in this quote. Each one of us is a cause of global warming, but each one of us can make choices to change that with the things we buy, the electricity we use, the cars we drive. We can make choices to bring our individual carbon emissions to zero. The solutions are in our hands. We just have to have the determination to make it happen. Not only that, but in the end credits of the movie, there's a list of about 20 to 30 uh, practical suggestions of things that people could do uh, after, they'd, after they'd actually watched the movie. Things like buy a hybrid car, uh, walk or ride a bicycle when you can, uh, recycle, tell everyone you know about this movie. So it was not only the facts of climate change and the argument behind, behind why we have to do something, but actual practical suggestions of what people can do. It's been six years uh, since that film came out, and the world is a radically different place. Um, people no longer drive uh, cars that, uh, that rely entirely on petrol. Um, almost all of our electricity is produced using solar power. Um, people don't use plastic bags when they go to the shops, and the food in those shops isn't packaged in plastic anymore because people have really internalized this message. <laughs> Except that they haven't. And what I'm going to talk about today is looking at some of the reasons why they might not have uh, acted or, or why the response has been underwhelming given the scale of the, of the climate change challenge. Um, and what I'm going to look at in particular is human relationships, uh, our relationships with ourselves, our relationships with others, and how those impact on the way that we relate to nature and, and try and answer this question of why the response has been underwhelming. Um, and the first writer that I'm going to, to look at is a guy called A.H. Almas, a spiritual teacher and a writer. Uh, and he says some quite radical things about the kinds of relationships that we typically have in the world. Um, he has this view that we, we're very good at adopting all of the habits that make us appear to be adult uh, in our day-to-day -day functioning in the world. But that, in fact, what many people are doing is behaving more like children in a nursery. What he means by this is that Fundamentally, there's still a, a big part of us that wants to be protected and provided for the way we were when we were kids. So we, we look for opportunities in the world to be looked after in that way. Now, that's a very general statement, but I think it, 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 becomes, it becomes kind of clearest when you look at examples of, of intimate relationships, romantic relationships. This is a scene from The Notebook. Um, there's another movie, Jerry, Mag Jerry, Jerry Maguire, where the character says to, uh, to his partner, you complete me. And I think if you look at a lot of um, popular songs and movies and the, and the kind of romantic thread that runs through them, there's often this idea of, well, you'll find a partner and they'll complete you. Now, for Almas, this is very much staying in that child space and looking for somebody else who, at the end of the day, might protect you or provide for you. There's another thinker, a guy by the name of Eric Byrne uh, in the 50s, a psychiatrist who wrote a book called Transactional Analysis and Psychotherapy, he pretty much invented uh, this concept of transactional analysis. Um, it sounds uh, kind of like something that belongs more in the corporate space or a banking space, but it's actually just about looking at the interactions between people. And one of the things that he identified is that by looking at a whole lot of these interactions, he came up with this idea that whenever we interact with another person, we are usually coming from one of three ego states, either the parent state the adult state or the child state. And the other person is also reacting to us from one of those three states. Your parent state, it's on, the, it's on the slide, but it's internalized messages from carers. It's the kind of example that we pick up as we're growing up from parents, authority figures, etc. The child 
is all those fears and insecurities we have when, when we're a small child and that need to be protected and that need to be provided for. And then the adult state is very much about, here's a phrase called reality data. So it's about looking at a situation as you find it's, yourself in that situation, in the present, and saying, what are my resources and how can I best respond to the situation? The example that I love, and I, I, I hear it a lot, and it, it usually makes me laugh, is uh, you hear it a lot in South Africa where people will say something like, um, and this is a parent-parent interaction, they'll say, you know, I went to home affairs, and, and you know, I stand in the queue for four hours, and then I got to the front, and the woman was just useless. And the other person will say, yeah, you know, you're right. Everywhere you go, you just can't get any good service in this country. Yeah, you know, you're right. The whole country's good. You know, and the whole thing just kind of snowballs along. And the, the, the beautiful thing that he says is that an adult response, um, and, and I, I, I try and do this to people sometimes, it's quite funny how it can stop them in their tracks, is to actually come back with the data. And, you know, sometimes say something, well, that's interesting because, you know, I actually went to home affairs the other day and, and they were actually quite efficient. And, you know, they actually served me in an eye. And that did actually happen. That did actually happen in Cape Town. <laughs> so, so that adult space is very much about the reality data. The other, the other nice example, I think, is of the parent-child relationship. Um, and, and I think the women in the audience will identify this, and it's quite relevant at the moment, um, is that when men get man flu, which is much worse than, than the female version, um, they typically go into the child state. They might be 35, 40, 50, but they want their wife to take, or their partner to take care of them, and now you must step back into the mother role. And Byrne doesn't say this is necessarily a problem. It might, you know, in that relationship work, and in that situation you're feeling sick, there's nothing wrong with that. So it's not necessarily uh, the case that he's saying we must always be in these adult-to-adult -adult interactions. It's more a case of being aware what state we're acting from and what impact that's having on the relationship. So what I want to look at is our relationship with nature. But before I, I, I relate the, the, the burn and the Elmas to that relationship, I think it's interesting to think about our relationship with nature. I think when I say relationship with nature, I think most people imagine something like this. Um, this is McClear's Beacon, I think, the highest point on Table Mountain. We imagine uh, going for a hike on Table Mountain or going for a surf or going mountain biking and we're out in nature and it's an unspoiled patch of our natural environment and we, you know, we get something from it and we come back feeling refreshed and we feel calmer when we're there and it's really beautiful. And in Cape Town that's very possible and it's amazing. But actually, for me, one of the most interesting places where our relationship with nature plays out is here. Um, there's, there's one of these in Orange Street, which I think is particularly interesting in that it has so many aspects of the way that we are relating to nature actually captured in it. We can get petrol for our cars. Now, that oil came out of the ground, out of the earth, and this is the point where we get to put it into our cars. We can buy food, um, which is packaged in plastic and refrigerated using electricity and has come from a farm somewhere, but still, it's actually our link to the natural world. It's our link to how we get our food. We can even buy pre electricity at the quick shop and we can, you know, go home and cook and heat our homes and so on using electricity that's generated in South Africa mostly of coal that again was dug out of the earth. So it's this amazing nexus of all these connection points that actually is where our relationship to nature is playing out. So what I'd like to suggest is that perhaps in the way that we relate to nature, we are still very much in a parent-child relationship. We are the child, the earth is the parent, and we expect to be provided for, we expect for the earth to just keep providing for us. We don't really consider the reality data when we're looking at how we should continue to relate to the world. And it's a very interesting point, this, because Al Gore did such a good job of presenting that reality data, and, and it, I don't think it was that people didn't understand his argument. Some people try and you know, come up with counter-arguments, and that's, that's fine, that's, you know, that's their right to do that. But I don't think it's that we didn't understand, and I don't think that the, the urgency of it is in question. It's just that if people are in a parent-child relationship, they're not in the mode of, of consider, considering the reality data when they make their decisions about the relationship. So the conclusions out of this is that we, we really have to think carefully about a couple of things. The one thing is, how do we shape our messaging going forward around climate change? Is it really about hammering on and on and on about the facts and figures and what the data is? Or is that stuff simply going over people's heads because of the type of relationship that they have with Earth and the type of the relationship that, that um, human beings have had with, with the Earth 
forever and ever almost. I mean, this is a major, major change. All of a sudden, the numbers of people on the earth and the impact that we have, are having on the earth is calling for us to change the nature of that relationship, and can we do it? And the second thing, and the thing that's interesting to me, and I guess why this topic is interesting to me, is how do we then work with people? How do we then work with people around helping them to do the work to change the nature of that relationship? And what's interesting to me is that inner work, call it whatever you want, personal development, self-development, is then not different from the work that needs to be done to actually combat climate change, to help us to find a more sustainable way to live in our natural environment. It's actually the same work. So when, we, when we're doing that self-development work, we're actually doing the work of finding a way to live in the world in a more sustainable way. So in conclusion, the, the most succinct way that I can put that is that until we find a way to manage our internal resources in a sustainable way, there's very little chance that we're going to find a way to manage our external resources in a sustainable way. Thank you very much.